Hello everyone and welcome to this recitation video. Today we are going to solve a few problems from our Introduction to Thermodynamics lecture video. So make sure to check that video out if you haven't already. We are going to start with some easy problems and finish with a challenging one. So without further ado, let's begin. Here is problem one. The question is a very simple conceptual one. If put a soda can inside the fridge, how do you treat this soda can thermodynamically? It's always a good move to draw a sketch of the problem. You don't need to be super accurate. We just need a representation of what's going on. Here is a can of soda. The red lines show the boundaries of this system. It's in the fridge, so heat is crossing the boundaries and going out of the can and into the fridge space, which is our surroundings. However, no mass is crossing any of the boundaries. By definition, because mass is not entering or exiting through any of the boundaries, we are dealing with a closed system. Now let's go to problem two. It asks to name two examples of control volumes in our daily life. Uh, we already know some industrial examples of control volumes, such as pumps, turbines, and such, but here we are looking for some easier examples. First example is when we are boiling some eggs. When water reaches the boiling point, some of it start to evaporate and leave the system, which is drawn here on the right. So mass is crossing the boundaries, and so this system of pot, egg, and water is a control wall. Another example is something very familiar, a car's radiator. The water that circulates through the engine absorbs excessive heat from the engine components and then returns to the radiator to dump all of that heat into the passing air. Hot water enters from the top of our system and when cooled down exits from the bottom. So a constant mass flow is crossing the boundaries of the radiator. And so is a control volume. So this is our first real problem that we are dealing with numbers and such. It's very straightforward. It says pressure of the gas in the tank and also uh, the atmosphere pressure are known. The density of the mercury is known. Uh, what is H? Now for this kind of problems dealing with manometers and barometers, uh, you need to remember two points. Point one is the Pascal's law that says pressures on a horizontal line inside the same fluid are equal and point two that says the pressure at the interface of two fluids is the same for both fluids. Knowing these two points, we can start. First, let's make sure that our units are consistent. Pressures are given in kilopascals, and if we use them in that format, we get H in kilometers, which is not desirable, really. So let's change the units from kilopascals to pascal, if we want H to be in meters. 130 kilopascals is 103 times 10 to the power of 3 pascals, and 100 kilopascals is 100 times 10 to the power of 3 pascals. Now, Pascal's law says P of point A is equal to P of point B, because they are on a horizontal line inside Mercury. From point 2, we know that PA is also equal to the P of the gas in the tank. PB, on the other hand, is the pressure of atmosphere plus the column of mercury. Now we need to find the density of mercury. It's given in the format of a specific gravity, which is the ratio of density to density of pure water at 4 degrees Celsius, which is 1,000 kilograms per meter cube. Plug the numbers in and we get rho of Hg, Hg is um, mercury, is equal to 13,600 kilograms per meter cube. Back to our previous equation, after a bit of algebra, we get H to be 0.22 meters or 22 centimeters. Okay, uh, so this problem gets you familiar with the concept of manometers. Now we can move to problem four. This one is a more complex manometer problem and probably the one that you are going to encounter in exams. We can go with the previous two tips only and gradually find same pressure points inside each fluid 
which takes a bit of time and may become confusing because there are three different fluids here. Or use a new tip. Start from a point of interest, in this example, the air pressure at the interface of air and water, and move to the next point of interest, which here is the interface of water and oil. If we're going down inside the fluid to get to the point of interest, we need to add the pressure. If we are going up and rising inside the fluid, we subtract from the pressure. Let's show that tip in action here. Point one is our first point of interest, and point two is our final point of interest. Now let's start moving from one to water oil interface. We're going down in water to reach a point with the same pressure, so we add the column of water to our pressure, like this. Next point of interest is the interface of oil and mercury. Again, we are going down. So add the column of oil to the equation. Finally, to reach point two, we have to rise in mercury. So subtract the column of mercury to finally get P2. We know P1 is the pressure of trapped air and P2 is atmospheric pressure. Doing some algebra, we get the final equation. Please take note that the portions of the same fluid on both sides of the U-tube are not important. As you go down one side and rise the same distance on the other leg of the U, and so they cancel each other. Only the actual rise on either leg is important for us. Okay, problem five. So in lecture, we discussed that hydraulic jacks and hydraulic lifts are simple devices that use Pascal's law. The idea of the problem is very simple here. We want to hold the 2,500 kilograms car in the air using a 25 kilogram box. How big is the piston under the car? Pascal's law suggests that point one and two have the same pressure. P1 is equal to P2. We know that pressure is force over area. So F1 over A1 is equal to F2 over A2. Just a reminder that the area of a circle, because pistons are usually circular, is pi times diameter squared over 4. Forces acting on each piston are the weights of the car on piston 2 and box on piston 1. Plug in everything we have in this equation. Uh, G's, pi's, and 4's are cancelled, and we get d2 squared equals 100 times 100 which means D2 is 100 centimeters. Okay, problem six. We have some air trapped inside a piston and a cylinder. The piston itself is five kilograms, and there is also a spring that is pushing the piston down with a force of 100 newtons. Area of the piston is known. Problem asks, what is the air gauge pressure? Now, when dealing with forces, it's always suggested to draw the free body diagram for your problem. Let's draw one here. This is our piston, and let's add the forces acting on it. Pressure of trapped air is pushing from below, while the atmospheric pressure, uh, the force of a spring, and the weight of the piston are pushing it down. There is no motion. The piston is uh, stationary. So the summation of all forces acting on it is zero, meaning pressure of air times A is equal to F of spring plus weight plus the pressure of atmosphere times A. Before we continue, make sure that we have unit consistency. In SI, the consistent unit used for area is meter square. So it's always practical to convert anything else to meters square. How do we do that? We know that if we multiply a number by 1 over 1, nothing changes, right? So let's do that. 1 centimeter is 0.01 meters. So 1 centimeter squared is 0 0.0001 meters squared. Now we can multiply 50 centimeters squared by 0 0.0001 meters squared over 1 centimeter squared. Now, because those two numbers are actually the same, it is just like multiplying 50 
by 1 over 1. Centimeters squared will cancel each other. And we are left with A is equal to 0 0.005 meters squared. We can plug in everything now in our force equation. Now we get P of air minus P atmospheric times the area is the weight plus the force of the spring. P air minus P atmospheric is actually the air gauge pressure, which is 100 plus 5 times 10 over area, which is 0 0.005 meters squared. We get P air gauge is uh, 120,000 pascals or 120 kilopascals. I hope you were able to follow this problem. It's very straightforward once you draw the four, uh, free body diagram and pay attention to the units. Finally, we are here at problem 7. This is our last problem of the day and arguably the most challenging one. The setup is similar to problem 6 with a twist. We already know the current pressure of the system, but are interested in the new pressure when the valve gets, is opened and the piston rises one centimeter. The tricky part is we don't know anything about the spring force. So let's revisit an old equation from general physics, the equation of spring force. Force is a spring constant times how much the spring is compressed or elongated from its uh, rest position. We need to find both if we want to know uh, the spring force. We know the spring is at rest when piston is on the bottom of the cylinder. That's our first clue. We can use it to find K or spring constant. Free body diagram of the initial state is drawn here. F of the spring plus the weight of the piston is equal to the gauge pressure of air uh, trapped inside times area. Check unit consistency again. Diameter is given in millimeter and we need to change it to meter. Again, the piston has no motion, so P1 times A is equal to F of spring plus W for the weight. Plug in numbers, changing kilopascals to pascals on the way, we get that F of a spring is 8,735.7 newtons. Okay, we found the force on the left-hand side of the string equation. Well, now, what about the right-hand side? Delta X is the distance from the bottom of the cylinder where the spring didn't exert any force and was at rest. We can find it using our other data input, the volume. Use the unit conversion, one liter is 10 to minus three meters cubed to see that our volume is five times 10 to minus four meters cubed. Now the volume of the cylinder is height times the base area. Plugging our numbers, we get that delta x1 is 0 0.028 meters or 28 millimeters. Using our newly found value for delta x1, we can finally find the constant k. K is around 312,000 newtons per meter. Okay, now we have everything to find the new pressure when piston is raised one centimeter. Delta X2 is delta X1 plus one additional centimeter or 0.01 meters. Free body diagram for our new state is shown here. T2 times A is equal to the new spring force, F of a spring 2, plus the weight. Plug in everything we have and do some algebra, and we get P2 is equal to 676,571.7 pascals. Now, this problem was challenging because we needed additional information, spring equation, actually, 
to fully understand and solve it. We also needed to use the data that we had somewhat creatively. To wrap this video up, remember please that always draw a sketch for your problem and if applicable, draw a free body diagram as well. This simple task will always help you with understanding of the problem. Again, thank you for sticking around to the end of yet another video. Please leave a comment if you have any questions regarding these problems or anything thermodynamic in general.